Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying this year's No Fear event. Uh, we've had a lot of great feedback from everyone, um, and I hope that we've we've enjoyed being able to put it on for you. And I hope that you've learned a lot of valuable information. Um, being able to provide expert advice on how to write the best resume, use LinkedIn to your advantage, get more job interviews. That's our goal with this event. And so judging by the, the feedback that we've gotten, I think we've been able to do that. This session is going to be no different. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion with some recruiters, and you'll get to hear their answers to common questions from job seekers. Um, before we start the panel discussion, um, I want to remind you that we're running a 20% off promotion right now. You'll see the link that you can use up in the top right hand corner here. It's jobscan.co slash promo slash no fear 2022, and you'll get 20% off of Jobscan premium. Um, and that's 20% off forever, by the way. It's not just your first month. It's every month that you use it. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of that now. Um, if you're anxious to hear the giveaway code for this session, I'll share that towards uh, towards the end so you can use that for the giveaway that we're doing. Um, now, this panel, just FYI, went underwent a few last-minute changes. We were originally going to be joined by Ediana and Tejal, so you saw that on the invite. Um, those two recruiters had to uh, cancel last minute, so thankfully uh, Kelly Rivnack is still joining us, and we're joined by a special guest, Kyle Law, who is our uh, lead recruiter here at JobScan, so he's going to share his expertise as a recruiter and then everything that we know here at JobScan, too, so it's going to be a really great panel discussion. Um, I want to let both of you introduce yourselves um, tell them, you, tell the audience your experience and what you'll be able, uh, what you'll be able to share in this session. Uh, Kelly, you want to go first and tell them a little yeah. bit about yourself? Sure. So my name is Kelly Rivnack. I'm the founder and also recruiter, basically 360 uh, recruiter for technology and digital marketing. So have always been kind of more so hyper localized in the DC Baltimore area, but certainly have grown um, to support talent and companies across the nation. So here to provide the perspective of more of a third-party agency perspective. Awesome. Okay, Kyle, how about you? All right. Yeah, I'm Kyle. Um, as mentioned, I'm the internal recruiter here at JobScan. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half. This is my first time recruiting internally. So I have a little bit of insight in terms of you know internal processes, but I also came from the staffing agency world before this. So I've worked with a lot of different tech companies, um, mainly recruiting for tech mm -hmm. positions. So a lot of my answers may be framed around the IT and tech field. I uh, apologize for that. That's just kind of where my expertise lands. So uh, hopefully you can still get some good information on this. Awesome. Yeah, I like um, the the background of working with a staffing agency because I know for me, you know, having been a job seeker before, I sometimes get contacted by staffing agencies. And I always wonder if the process is different or if the offers are as legitimate as if I were just to apply to a company. So it kind of would be interesting to hear those different perspectives of working with a company or working with a staffing agency. Um, questions that were submitted by uh, registrants and attendees. And so we're going to start with those. We're going to answer those questions first. We do have the Q&A box as the same we've had with all the other sessions. So you can submit your questions there. Um, Paige, you can't see her right now, but Paige from JobScan, she's hosted a couple other sessions. She's going to be moderating that Q&A box. Um, so if there's some questions there that we get, we can get to, we're going to get to those. Um, but I'll start first with a question from one of our registrants. Um, we'll start simple here. So what is the best way to contact a recruiter? Um, what method do you prefer, prefer or what do you think is, is the most effective? Um, Kelly, I'll start with you and then we can just go in a circle. Sure, absolutely. So again, as a consultant, I work with a number of different companies that might have different needs. So this is going to be a little bit different. So when people reach out to me, and I think this will hold true for most recruiters, is that a general, and I still get a lot of these messages of, hey, I'm in the job market. What do you have for me? Do you have anything that would be a good fit? And I think when you ask that question, you're leaving a lot of trust and assumptions for a recruiter to make those assessments of what would be appropriate for you. And you know, some recruiters might have the time or be able to invest that much time to help with some of that career coaching. 
or advise on what might be a great fit. I would say the more effective way of contacting a recruiter and you know, a lot of recruiters have tons of messages. They have to allocate their time um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think in terms of being more effective and speed, <clears throat> speedy and getting a response would be to craft a message about, I'm in the job market, but also being a little bit more specific in terms of what your area of expertise could be. So that could be technical skill sets, that could be the job titles that you're that you're targeting, that can be the companies, that can be, are you looking for remote? Are you open to hybrid? What kind of radius? So kind of being very specific in terms of what criteria is going to be important to you in your search. You know, it, it doesn't have to be an essay, but it would be very helpful in terms of just defining what that criteria looks like in the message. Um, and I'm sure Kyle will speak to this a little bit too, but if you are internal or if there is a particular job that you're referencing as well, I would also include that in your message. If there was something that caught your eye, include the URL dropped into the message as well. Um, I know that there has been a question about whether you should attach your resume when you are reaching out. As a, a consultant, I'm not going to you know, look down on a resume if you're sending it to me. Um, I know that, you know, if you're moving forward and targeting a particular role that sometimes typically you'll have a base resume and maybe be altering that depending upon what job it is. So that might look differently if you are contacting a very specific company internally. Me, I'm going to be a little bit more lenient and work with you a little bit to advise on, you might want to re, you know, re, and I, I don't rewrite resumes, but, but have them advise in terms of you might want to kind of restructure this so it's more appropriate to the job that you're applying to. Interesting. Yeah. So that was one of the, the follow-up questions is, should I just reach out and send a message? Should I send my resume? Should I just talk about my value add or the skills that I have? Kyle, what do you think about that? Should they be specific about what they can add or just send a resume? What do you think is more effective? Yeah, I think being specific is the best way to go. Um, any way you can relate your experience to the role, um, it just shows that you're you're thinking at the, of the position at a higher level than just sending your resume over and hoping to get a response. Um, so yeah, it just it just demonstrates a lot higher level of profession. Um, Interesting. That makes sense. So then, what would be the best um, platform, I guess, to reach out to a recruiter? Like, let's say they see the job is open and they want to get like a one-to-one -one connection to the recruiter. How would, what would be the best platform for that? I, uh, I'll go, go quickly. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say, I mean, you can reach me through LinkedIn. I mean, I will admit, you know, in a day, my box starts to get buried and I would love to say that I go through and, you know, I try and keep on top of that. I think anybody's inboxes tend to get buried, whether it be email, but, you know, Hopefully if you find me, I mean, hit me up on both. If you're finding me on email, if you find me on LinkedIn, do whatever you need to do to contact me. And again, kind of leave the ball in our courts too. I mean, trust me that a recruiter is looking to fill all their recs. Like it is, it's not fun for them to have to continually not look for talent to fill that. So if you are contacting me and it looks like there's enough information there to warrant a call for an interview and a screening, then they will do that. So, you know, as long as you're, messaging and whatever channels I would say that works any of those channels work best for me anything to add Kyle or kind of uh, no I would second that um, email LinkedIn uh, if, if you have my email great if you, have, if you can find my LinkedIn that's even better uh, that's yeah just direct contact the easiest way does it um does it help like it does it make a big difference if you're an applicant, and then you reach out directly to the recruiter, would you say that increases the candidate's chances of getting an interview or at least just getting considered? I think I'll start does. with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think it does. Um, if you can just get the attention of the recruiter, and again, you can really kind of sell your experience a little bit more than just sending a resume over. Um, and kind of shortening that cover letter in a, in a message over LinkedIn is just a great way to get attention. And uh, many people have gotten hired to hear job scan through that method. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And so that makes me think of one thing that was mentioned actually um, in a session this week is that the, the traditional cover letter where you type out a letter, put it on stationary, give it to somebody like that doesn't really exist anymore. But there is a time and a place for a cover letter. And one of those would be actually just the email that you send to the recruiter. 
Um, Kelly, would you say like that is kind of the new version of the cover letter and and probably the best way whenever you do reach out to kind of use that same messaging? I think, you know, I know there's a lot of debate about the the use of cover letters. And, you know, I think that it can't, it just honestly, it comes down to if the recipient reads that content or not. And you have some people that just don't care and don't have any use to, to basically read that information. There's others who I've, there's hiring managers I work with who love to read that. It depends upon you know, if it's a career pivot, if it's entry level, it does provide a little bit more information. I would say probably not adding it as an additional document, but putting it in the body of whatever messaging that you're sending would be great. Um, I mean, I will say a couple of weeks ago, somebody had sent me, and apparently this tool has been around for years. Career coaches told me, I've never seen one, but it was called like a marketing resume. Um, but somebody had sent me something that was very thought out um, and again, this probably would not work best for internal recruiters who have a very specific role. But for me, who's a little bit more open in terms of trying to figure out what clients uh, would be a good fit for this person is they had written out basically um, kind of a higher level cover letter of their experience, their passions, why this was a passion, their strengths, just all of like that criteria in a document and sent it to me. And I was like, this is amazing. This is much this provides me with a lot more information that I can work with um, as far as what might be attractive to you and what might not be. So again, this would probably not work very well for internal recruitments, but if you are working with any search firms, executive search firms, external recruiters, I found this to be just a very thoughtful document that also showed that that job seeker had given a lot of thought about what their next steps are too. So you know, I will say sometimes I'll work with people and they have just got to the point where they're over their job completely and they want out, but they haven't thought about what next steps look like. And for recruiters, you know, a lot of us don't have time to help you kind of sort through that. So I think having that clarity in terms of just what your strengths are, what next steps look like is a really important process of the job search itself. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm thinking like a, a few takeaways from this question is, um, one, yes, definitely reach out to the recruiter if you can, um, but then also keep it targeted. So the message that you send them, if you are going to send a cover letter, um, keep it really specific and targeted, um, which really like goes along with a lot of things that we promote at JobScan too, like in terms of resume optimization is that you might have like your master resume, but really try to customize it for each job listing um, because then it's hyper relevant. And then Kelly, like you were saying, you can see directly, like, okay, this is how their experience relates to what I'm looking for. Um, so being like specific and targeted is a good tip there. Um, okay. So then moving, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, one question that came up and really has come up a lot, just being um, in the content department at JobScan, I, I see this question a lot of uh, dealing with, with ageism, especially for people that are making a, a career change, but really just in general, you know, the question is, how do I get around ageism? How do they deal with that? Um, Kelly, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what advice would you give? All right. So this might be unpopular opinion with a lot. I know that there's a lot of resume tips and hacks to kind of make it look like, you know, I've heard don't use AOL addresses and you know, I mean, you need to do what you need to do, I guess, if you want to follow that. I will say that, um, you know, when you're looking at ageism, I think a lot of it depends upon how you're structuring. If you're looking at a resume and how you present yourself is, you know, get away from the years of experience and more so focus on what experience is relevant to whatever job target that means. So if we're talking about a resume, I mean, you don't need to, you know, career expert with 20 years of experience, I wouldn't be quantifying your years of experience at all as a marketing tool for whatever job you're targeting. So I think with ageism, it's really kind of addressing the elephant in the room is a good way of putting it is, you know, you could kind of mask a resume however you'd like, but at the end of the day, and not to say that, you know, at some point that conversation is going to come up, but if you're looking at a resume and seeing kind of career gaps or whatever it might be, I think that people are going to want to know a little bit about your history. And I think it's about reframing how you're giving that experience, if it makes sense. So um, see, I'm trying to think of a good way of putting that. So thinking of a couple of common objections that I've seen is, 
you're overqualified, you're going to get bored. Um, you know, you might be, they might think that you're too expensive um, in terms of what their, their role is. So kind of identifying straight up what you think those objections will be and addressing them in an interview, I think is the best way to kind of overcome that ageism. Mm, okay. Um, Kyle, what do you think about that of like, not, not avoiding the topic, but finding a way to reframe it as a strength um, and also like focusing on the relevant skills? Like how would, how would you approach that? Yeah, I think there's a way you can definitely frame it as a strength um, while still focusing on your more recent relevant experience. That is really the most important part of, I guess, getting over that ageism barrier. I think ageism is really born out of, uh, I guess, worry or concern that someone hasn't kept up their skill set within their career field, especially as a lot of careers become more tech focused and are just driven by different products and software. Uh, any, anybody who has any type of job out here in the modern work, workforce, works with software regularly, um, needs needs some technical acumen. Um, I think the older workforce can sometimes fall out of that depending on where they came into their profession. Um, so I, just keeping up on skills is just number one. But there's, yeah, like like it was mentioned, there there are hacks in there that unfortunately um, do help you. It shouldn't, shouldn't have to exist, but, you know, only including relevant years of experience, not pointing out things like graduation date on your resume, just things to not clearly call yourself out as, you know, being, being someone who's a, a more senior candidate. Yeah. So that was going to be a, a follow-up question is like, I can imagine how in a job interview, you could um, use that opportunity to frame things as a strength, but um, like specifically on the resume or the job application. Well, I guess, first of all, I, I would like to ask if you don't mind either one of you answering this. Um, does this happen often? Like, do you think that if a person is a certain age, um, is there a legitimate way that they could avoid being taken out of the candidate pool because of their age just on the resume? Does that happen where it's like, you're this age, you're just not qualified. Are there things they can do to, to get around that? Oh, I mean, I don't know how to, I mean, I think that if you're, if you're looking and again, I mean, you, you keep pictures off a resume, right? But then people can cross-reference LinkedIn if that information is available there, or if you're writing your whole history out. And again, I think at some point, eventually uh, your, your job journey and your whole document is going to come to fruition too. So if, if people are, 100% biased, then regardless how, I mean, you're going to have to do a lot of convincing, I think, during that process for them to basically change their tune in terms of hiring. So again, you can do all of the resume tricks, but I think a lot of that is being able to get to an interview where you're able to have that conversation and convince them that, hey, listen, these objections exist. If you think, as you said, like tech skills and certainly being able to keep up on some of the latest technology can help to prove <clears throat> that, hey, I'm not out to date, or if, you know, there is a culture fit, you know, objection about how you won't fit into the culture and being able to have that conversation about, hey, listen, like I worked with these diverse groups here and there, and, you know, this is the story that I have to tell, or, you know, maybe financially too. And I think that we're, have obviously seen that now salary, salary transparency and people are posting their, their salary ranges. So that information should be available and they should have that knowledge sitting down that I'm comfortable with the range. Maybe, and I've talked to people where, you know, depending upon where they are in life, that they're willing to kind of take a step back in terms of they don't want to manage people anymore. They don't want to, you know, oversee P&L or whatever it might be. And having that conversation during the interview is important to address that, you know, these aren't important to me now. If there is that bias that exists about, whatever it might be about why ageism would be the problem of being bored or, you know, find they might be financially stable where they don't need to make this much money. And have, I think just having that true, honest conversation while you're, when you have the chance to have the interview is, is helpful. You know, again, there's the resume hacks that exist. I don't know if there's any magic way to kind of, you know, hide that or, or get around that because I think eventually it's just going to come to fruition once you are interviewing. Okay. So that makes me think, Kyle, what do you think about, um, Kelly mentioned mentioning like certifications and training. Do you think that something like citing 
you know, recent um, certifications around, say, like new technology, if that's relevant to their field, doing that or reaching out to the to the recruiter directly so they have a, another chance to kind of sell themselves. Do you think those are, are two things they could do to kind of overcome that? Yeah, definitely. I, I think certifications definitely show that someone's keeping up on, you know, some some level of skill set that's important to their career. Um, and then, yeah, reaching out to a recruiter and actually kind of giving your story about uh, what it is you're looking for, what you're okay with in terms of your next career step. Um, it just makes it way easier to then sell, you know, kind of sell you as a candidate to a client or to a hiring manager. Yeah. Um, you know, I do want to say like, it's, it's kind of an unfortunate reality that it sometimes happens. I know at JobScan, um, this has never been a problem for us. So Kyle, you probably don't have like a ton of experience with that, but I know that it is an unfortunate reality of being a job seeker because of how many people ask this question. So those tips I'm sure are, are very um, helpful. There's a, there's a question that came up in the Q and A that I think is relevant to this exact question. Um, how can you transition from senior management back to individual recruiter without it being seen as a negative or a red flag. So like Kelly, you mentioned, maybe they've decided, I don't want to be a people manager. How could they say that or word that on their resume without it looking like a, like a red flag? I think you almost have to rebrand your resume. And trust me, I've spoken to plenty, especially on the technical side where they get into management and they're like, I don't want to manage people anymore. <laughs> I want to go back to being an IC and you know, I want to go back to coding and call it a day. And so I don't think that that's abnormal. I think it's a matter of almost rewriting your resume where it's not screaming management and you know this is what I want to do and just targeting that to be more of that I see and highlighting that experience on the resume. So then you have the phone call and have those conversations with whoever it might be in terms of, yes, you know I've had this experience managing people. I don't want to do this anymore and I want to go back to that. So I think a lot of that is, again, if we're looking at resume, online presence is just basically writing that narrative towards that as opposed to management, if that makes sense. Yeah. Kyle, anything to add on that? I don't know if I can add much more. I think uh, what you said is exactly right. right uh, creating that narrative of what you're looking for next and um, you know, presenting your, your previous experience as targeting that. Um, I actually don't see um, going from management to like individual contributor usually is not a huge issue. I think a lot of hiring managers actually like that because they say, hey, this person is, you know, capable enough to be a manager. Now they want to be an individual contributor. They can likely manage themselves very well. And it just makes them a stronger candidate. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's a question somewhat related to, to this. Um, so the question is, what advice would you give to an older person, 55 years and older, regarding how to write their resume with so many years of experience? Um, so possibly related to, to agents, but just in general, they have decades possibly of experience how do they get that all into a couple of pages um kyle i'll start with you what would be your advice on how to how to manage that um it's probably differing opinions on this um like i like said earlier i'd say just focus on the most relevant amount of years um i probably wouldn't go past 20 just it depends on your career fields if you work especially in tech technology's changed in the last 20 years so whatever you did before then isn't as relevant these days, unfortunately. Um, I think that's, yeah, kind of a, a quick and easy one. Um, but yeah, shortening as much as you can and truncating the, the information as much as you can. So it's not going too long as a resume and keeping it on two pages. Okay, Kelly, what about you? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm not a stickler for a one page resume. I think if you have 20 years of experience, you can let that spill over. I will say that a lot of people think a resume is your autobiography and it doesn't need to be that way. So um, obviously I think that the emphasis where people's eyes, where recruiters eyes go to is your most recent experience. So if you can add more detail, of course, if it's relevant to your target, then you know, bulk up on more of your most recent experience. And then once you get around 15, I mean, I've seen people say other basically dwindle down to just like company and title and years of experience if you feel it's necessary um, to add that other other experience. But if you're listing out a job that you did 15 years ago and it has 10 bullet points underneath, I mean, you're taking up a lot of real estate on a resume and not to say that it's not irrelevant, but you don't need to be adding tons of detail 
on dated experience. So just really, you know, people are tacking on experience, experience. I don't think they're going back and editing their whole story. So just take a look at that page two and see what needs to be there. And I guarantee that a lot of that information just um, could probably be condensed or removed. Yeah, I, I like that point. You know, if a person say they've been in the same career field, the same field for their career, um, chances are the experience they have over the past five to 10 years is going to be fairly similar to the experience they had before that. So um, anything, it, it might get redundant if you're listing jobs with similar responsibilities. And so really just focusing on the most recent and highlighting your achievements there. Um, one of the one of the sessions we had on writing a resume, um, I think it was Ediana Rosen, she mentioned that your resume should be a snapshot or a highlight reel. It's like a movie trailer. It's not a dump of all of your experience. You're really just catching the highlights to entice people to work with you. Um, you know, I, I guess the follow-up to that would be, what if you feel like it's all a highlight? Like, what would you say you would use as um, qualifications for these are the highlights you should mention? Like, I know you have maybe two pages, but focus on these aspects in order to narrow it down to, like, say, 10 highlights, if that we, that's what you were going to go on. Um, Kelly, how would you help them to, like, narrow it down to the best highlights? So if they're, let's just say if they're applying to a project management role and it's something specific and they're identifying the must-haves or what's going to be important for that project management role is going back and whether it's industry experience or basically achievements that would translate and be good talking points in an interview, I would highlight those. Um, and again, I mean, you shouldn't have 20 copies of a different resume. There's a base, you're swapping in certain certain aspects of that towards the title. I mean, I don't know too many people who are targeting like 10 different job titles. So it should be maybe a couple, but picking those different, I guess, relevant transferable skills from each of those jobs. Uh, and then including that, I guess, as highlight reels, if that makes sense to whatever job that you're targeting. Okay. So basically just hyper-specific to that particular job. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I just realized okay. like, I want to try to get to all these. So um, this is, this is another really good one. What do you look for in entry-level candidates? This is so tough. It's like every entry-level job, you have to have a bachelor's degree and five years of experience. So just honestly, what are you actually looking for in an entry-level candidate? Um, Kyle, uh, Kyle, I'll start with you. Uh, well, Honestly, I've not had to hire a ton of entry-level candidates. My experience in this is probably a little bit more limited. Um, I would say if, if I was, I, I'd be looking for really the standout candidates, um, the folks who did extra, you know, curriculars in school, things like that, got more involved than just going through the motions of getting a degree. Um, just really anybody who stands out is just going to be uh, a, a little bit more interesting, I, I'd say, as a candidate. But that that's where I would start again I don't hire a ton of entry level so it's not something I can give a ton of insight on okay um Kelly what would you say based on your experience yeah so I mean I wouldn't say that I've done a ton of um, recruitment for entry level but what I would say is that it's important for them and so when you're thinking about the amount of volume of entry level candidates that a recruiter or a company might be receiving is you have to think about the competitive landscape of all the other applicants that they're receiving. And I think what you need to do is have some kind of proof of whatever that skill set is. Now, understandable that a lot of these either college grads, high school grads don't have that work experience, right? So it's a catch 22. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, I mean, it can be volunteer work, it can be internships if you had that experience. I mean, I'm thinking even of like, you know, I've seen resumes of people that were in high school doing restaurant jobs and being able to kind of take a look of transferring <clears throat> those skills of, you know, you can definitely break it down into quantitative metrics, but there's, you know, customer service, there's, if you were hosting this, you know, feeding, you know, 400 people into, you know, a matter of this amount of time and Kind of taking those different skills that you've learned and showing proof i will say that and i think you know as kyle and, and myself as we're working in tech and marketing that there's a lot of opportunity to and yeah there's going to be a lot of pushback on this but at, in terms of kind of going out and seeking out project work to build out your portfolio mm -hmm. so 
if you're thinking social media and you're pursuing a job in social media, you know, go find like a local business. And, you know, yes, the ideal situation is to get paid to do that work. But, you know, if you're taking a look at if you're spending three hours a day applying to a job, jobs, you know, 100 jobs in three hours, or taking that three hours and dedicating it towards a project, what's your better ROI? So kind of starting to develop that project work and have something to speak about and show when you're going out on an interview and building out a portfolio, I think is a better return on your time um, in terms of just looking for work where you can show project work in that process. Yeah, that's a really good point. I just finding any way to and not just not just show skills, but develop those skills and get right. that experience. So if it's at your school, extracurricular activities or being part of a club or um, doing maybe like freelance or just some kind of project work, even volunteer work, or um, I think when I was in school, you could be a library assistant, like things like that, just finding any way to get that experience. It's not just about how, what can I get to put on my resume, but it's actual legitimate experience that can help you once you get the job to, to be good at that job. Um, so then here's a, here's a question that I see all the time. How do I avoid getting ghosted after the second round of interviews? I've actually been looking at the Q and a box and there's a few questions oh. about this too. <laughs> getting ghosted is a major pain point for job yeah. seekers. So what happens? Like they get interviews, maybe one or two, what happens? How can they avoid getting ghosted after that? Um, Kelly, I'll start with you. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could tell everyone that I can control everybody's actions, but I can't. So my, my best advice to anyone in the process is, and I go through this with everybody who I, during my discovery call in terms of talking about what that process should like look like. And I think it's important if you're going to start holding people accountable is basically asking them what the process looks like during that first call and asking at what point should I follow up and just gathering that information about, okay, great. So I should follow up with you in two weeks. I'll, you know, if you want to even pinpoint a date of, I will follow up. Do you prefer email? Do you prefer messaging? And just basically have them verify when and how you should follow up to hold them accountable. Now, whether they do or not is a totally different ball game. Like I, again, can't control other people's <laughs> actions, but I think and also that too is, is certainly being respectful of those timelines. Um, I will say it's a rarity where I've had people, you know, constantly emailing day by day. And, and I'm much more forgiving, but for some hiring managers and internal recruiters where it becomes a little bit overload and too much, if you're just constantly calling when you've given them a deadline as far as when you're going to be reaching out to them. Um, but that's, I think all that we can do is kind of manage expectations from the start and kind of adhere to those deadlines. and. I know. I mean, it's hard. I, it's, I, it can be frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely understand, especially when you invest your time in an interview process and a company you know, doesn't have a couple minutes to give you feedback. And it's, you know, there might not be context to that feedback, but just any feedback as far as, you know, yes, we're moving forward or passing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kyle, I'd like to get your thoughts on that of um, setting up a timeline of, of following up or, you know, maybe a little different, like is there a timeline that job seekers should keep in mind of when to know when to give up? Like maybe they'll never get the email saying we decided to move on. How do you know when getting ghosted is actually just they found another candidate was better? What would you say is, is the timeline there of when they should follow up or when they should just move on? Yeah, I would say um, it, following up for up to two weeks after you know your last in interview is perfectly fine and after that point if you don't get a response I personally I would give up and I would just say okay I'm not getting a response anymore it's unfortunate it should not happen um I would say just keeping up a professional cadence that's not you know to overload in between that time just every few days following up say hey is there something I can do to move this forward is there more information you need from me um, and setting up, like like uh, Kelly mentioned, setting up those expectations at the beginning on uh, when to follow up, when you can expect to hear back. Easiest thing you could possibly do, uh, but it's not a guarantee, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I think really um, the getting ghosted thing, it really just means that they found another candidate. And it's it's unfortunate for you because you wanted to be that candidate. And there are a few things you can do in terms of 
following up, you know, we talked about making that one, one-to-one -one connection with a recruiter. Um, but sometimes it's like, you might've gotten a couple interviews, but still it might just be time to, to move on. Um, so then another question is, is it most effective to apply directly from the company page or through job search platforms? I had never actually thought about this being a variable here. Um, Kyle, I'll start with you. Do you think that one is better than the other? I'm sorry, what was your question? It's, is it more, if, is it most effective to apply directly from the company page or through job search platforms? I'm guessing like Indeed I would, or. I would say it depends on what you're applying to. Um, if, if you were applying to one of my roles back when I was working at agency, just applying through any method would have been fine. I would have found your resume one or the other. I would say these days internally, if you're applying directly to the company, easiest, that's probably the easiest way to go, quickest way to go about it. Um, there's definitely resumes I see first these days. Okay, um, Kelly, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, again, as a working with a web portal, I'll see anyway. So I think probably listening to what Kyle has to say from coming in house, I will say that there are um, some platforms, I don't know if it's indeed is one, but third party platforms where some of those basically aggregate jobs from like corporate corporations or wherever it might be. And so some of those might not be up to date. Um, where there might be some frustration where I'm constantly hearing about, well, you know, this job closed and, and they don't keep that up to date. So, you know, the Indeeds or whatever it might be, might post it, leave it, and it floats out in the, the interwebs for a while. So I would say hopefully most of the um, corporate websites should be more up to date than those third parties. Okay, good to know. Um, all right, we've got a couple more and then hopefully we'll have time to get to some of the in the Q&A box. Um, what can I do if there aren't useful metrics to put under a role on my resume due to the nature of the work? We talk about um, showing measurable results, how important that is. What if it's not the kind of job where they can say I improved something by 20%? Um, Kelly, I'll start with you. What would what would you say to that person? Yeah, I know that makes sense. And I think, you know, for me too, when I'm working digital marketing where everything is KPI and you know, a lot of those people should, and sometimes I still don't see it. So I think in jobs where a lot of that is their day to day, that that should be easy to pull that information. Now, for others where it's just hard, um, there's other ways to quantify what you've done besides whether it's ROI or whatever it might be. So I'm thinking, you know, if it's, you know, you can use ranges. So if you don't have an exact number, you can use different ranges to kind of quantify um, you can use different like word choices and superlatives like less or first or, you know, increase or decrease. So kind of thinking about using those different words if you don't have a particular number um, is helpful. And um, kind of like scope of project as well is a way. I mean, if it's like six months or, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, I think that there's, and there's probably tons of lists out there. Probably JobScan has a couple that kind of help walk you through ways to, show your impact and results. And I think, you know, typical resume writing is like the star or car where you're doing challenge, action and results is structuring that way. And I think the big key is thinking about what that result is. So however that looks like, you know, quantifying that is important. Okay. Yeah, we do actually have an article on resume accomplishments okay. or achievements, how to list them. Um, Kyle, so what, what advice would you give? How could you do this? I, I like the point about um, scope of project, like if there was a timeline or a certain number of tasks or a deadline, those are, that's like a concrete thing that you achieved. Um, Kyle, what would you add to that of how they could handle that situation? Yeah, I would say there's always something you can quantify in terms of how your responsibilities help move the business organization forward or help the business organization accomplish their goals. It's, your position exists for a reason because you're, you're doing something to move the business forward and Really, maybe it's just thinking about what what it is that you're doing and finding ways, just quantifying that and uh, showing showing how uh, you know what you do day to day is leading to the company achieving its larger goal. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, last question here: If I know my skills are worth more than is being offered, how can I position myself to get more pay? And I assume by this point they're getting interviews if they feel like they can have this conversation. Um, but I suppose just in case, we'll, we'll start with both. Um, Kyle, so let's say I'm applying for a job and I feel like I could ask for more that's, than what's on the job description. Is there something they could do on their resume or in their application to position themselves to get more pay? 
uh, I, I feel like at the application level, it's not really even a discussion yet. Okay. Uh, maybe once you get onto that first call, you can say, hey, I noticed your range said this. Uh, for what I know, the market, you know, I'm probably closer to this. Is there some way we can get close to that number? If not, you know, let's not waste each other's time. Okay. Okay. So then is there um, certain positioning they could do? Like, so once they do get that interview of how they could um, position themselves to get more pay? Yeah. And um, I would say it's just referencing what, what the market is. Um, I mean, you can reference, Hey, I I've made this much in here and, you know, wherever I worked before, um, I would like to be close to that number or above it. Um, uh, you kind of have to have that data ready to go and, um, be ready to really kind of ar argue for it. Uh, but also be okay with, if they say no, being okay with walking away. Uh, and if that's okay with you, then you gotta make that up for yourself. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, Kelly, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, the salary I and mean, the past two years have been up and down. And I think we've all kind of are starting to see a little bit of an aftermath of that. But I think, you know, salary data is, you know, what it is right now too. So it's hard to kind of determine what is real and what isn't, I think, if that makes sense. So I think the best way to gauge what market value is, and to Kyle's point of being able to walk away is, taking the call with recruiters, having those conversations, kind of understanding in like <clears throat> real time today, what the market bears and understanding what those salary ranges are, just as you know, it's a kind of a thing of why you should be talking to recruiters or at least having engaging a little bit of conversation to know what the market bears. And, and that could change throughout, but that is the real data that you can use when you're having these conversations with companies. And if it's, you know, if you feel like you're really fighting for a salary and it's, it's way beyond, you know, it might be time to walk away and just keep your job. I mean, hopefully if it's not an urgent state of kind of continuing to seek out companies that will value your worth. Yeah, that makes sense. Good advice. Um, okay. Well, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. So I'm going to get to some of these questions that we've gotten live. Here's one. Um, so they have 20 plus years of experience and they have a director position, but they don't have a college degree. And I'm judging by the question, they feel like um, this is hurting them in either getting through the ATS or just as an applicant in general. Are there suggestions for a person that doesn't have a college degree, but is going for a really senior position? Um, Kelly, I'll start with you. What, what would you say? Any suggestions? I think it just depends upon the company policy and maybe the hiring manager is really what it, I mean, there's some companies that might just a degree is required and you can't, you can't work around it. And there's some hiring managers who might feel you need a degree and we're not going to work around it. So, I mean, unless that company has a reputation of where that would be required, then you probably can't skate around it. Um, but if that company is open and, you know, and kind of going back to the ageism too, and I think this is a good point of that I didn't bring up, it's almost doing some research I mean, LinkedIn is a great tool to go through the company and kind of take a look at the demographic itself too. And, you know, are they hiring a diverse group too? Is there representation of a diverse group currently there? Then you probably have a better shot in terms of, you know, being an applicant for that role. So kind of getting back to, I mean, if you do some research and see that there are people within the organization that don't have degrees, then maybe you have a more likelihood of being a candidate. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so Kyle, I'll, I'll start with you for the next question. Um, does the hiring team download and see the actual resume? So we know that an ATS would parse the text and maybe use that to automatically fill in certain fields um, in the system. But as a recruiter, do you actually see just like the PDF file that they send you as well? Uh, yes. I mean, it depends on your ATS system, but most give you the original form of the documents or, or a parsed version of it. And yes, most hiring teams will be, be provided the full resume before they're interviewing. Um, so yeah, I would say yeah, they're, they're one of this is the full thing. Yeah, we um so um job scan obviously we always we regularly do ATS research to make sure that our tool is up to date and what we're saying is up to date. And um, ATSs have gotten better at understanding resumes. But one thing that we do know is that at least the major ones, they will show the recruiter the actual file. So whatever it is that you've uploaded, they can see it. Um, they can download it if they want to. So yeah, they'll, they'll see that. Um, so a question 
Uh, what are some tips you can offer for clients that apply to tech companies? Kyle, I'm sure, I think you said you had a background in tech. What would you say just general, I'm guessing, resume or application tips for applying for a tech job? I, I don't know if there's a ton of different tips than just applying for any other job. It's the same as mm -hmm. any other. Um, try, to, try to tailor as much as you can to the specific role. Um, try to acknowledge um, specific technologies that they use and if you've used them or if you use something similar or um, have an interest in learning them, something. Um, okay. Just, yeah, pretty typical rules to apply. Do uh, do things like certifications matter? Does that make a big difference? It's, it'd be similar to like a boot camp, I think, in some ways. Um, okay. Yeah, it can matter mm -hmm. depending on what, what the actual skill set is. Um, yeah, it, it just really can depend on what exactly that certificate is for. Okay. Um, Kelly, I'd like to get your thoughts on this one. What's your personal opinion of a functional resume? So we know there's different formats, functional resumes. I think I've heard that recruiters often don't like those. What are your thoughts? Well, I admit they'll definitely throw me off uh, because I'm typically used to getting the chronological resume. So not to say that I'll throw them in the trash and not look at them. It takes me a little bit of adjustment to read, um, but I think that they can be, there could be an appropriate place for them when, you know, it's a career pivot, or I've seen some older, you know, professionals use that in terms of kind of condensing the relevant information and packing that up or more executives um, that will use that, that resume too. So I, there can be a, a time and place for them, but um, unless it's, Kind of these certain circumstances, I would typically follow a chronological resume. Okay, interesting. Um, so here's a here's an interesting question. How can I present myself with a criminal background on my record? What's the most effective way to address that elephant in the room? Um, Kyle, I'll, I'll start with you. What would you say? Is there something they can do? It sounds like they're they're okay with dress, addressing it confidently. How could they um, present themselves with that? That's. I, I don't know if I'm the best person to give advice on this. I mean, this is maybe just about an opinion. I, I would okay. say being upfront with it in the interview process before it pops up on a criminal background check. Uh, if you address it early, I think that's probably the best way. Um, and if you are, if it's something you can give an ex explanation around, um, either to ensure it's something that's not going to be an issue again, or uh, you know just something to alleviate the the concerns that a hiring person may have. Uh, it's probably the best way to go about it, in my opinion. Okay. Kelly, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some appropriate coaching here, but I would, uh, you know, I've run into it a couple times and, you know, I personally don't run the background checks. The companies I work with will run those. And so typically I'll be aware of if and when they will be conducting those, which is usually, you know, before an offer or when an offer goes out and contingent upon that background check. So uh, maybe an understanding of if a background check will be taking place, if the whatever is on that background check would be a problem and in conflict <clears throat> with that particular job uh, would probably be good to know as well. And I mean, if you're comfortable having that conversation with the recruiter or whoever it might be, then you know, certainly do that. Um, if you're not, then again, there's probably some coaching around what might be the appropriate tactic to go about that. Okay. Um, what are some common mistakes that applicants make? Kelly, have you seen any common mistakes they could avoid, not make? Oh, that's a big one. Um, I mean, I would say that again, clarity too. And I think as a recruiter who's receiving, you know, on the end of receiving a lot of resumes and messages about job search that, you know, I always dial back to the clarity part of being very, and, you know, again, you could go a couple different directions, but I think that, if you're making assumptions that somebody's going to take a look at your information and understand exactly what you're targeting, um, especially if it's more of a generalist or if that information is not in front of me, that you're putting way too much emphasis and trust in that recipient. So, you know, mm -hmm. make sure that you're just communicating exactly your achievements, you know, how those skills translate to that particular job. I think that that's the biggest misstep that I constantly see. And I think that's where everybody can tighten up their job search and probably see better results. Interesting. Kyle, any additional things like mistakes people make on their on their resume maybe? Um, yeah, I would say if there's any mistakes I often see, it's not, it's just poor attention to detail. 
Um, I've had tons of candidates just get rejected from hiring managers because they say, hey, I noticed they, you know, three spelling errors and this role that they're applying for is just very detail oriented and that's enough to have them, you know, rejected. So, uh, but uh, like Kelly said, um, being clear in terms of what it is you're targeting is obviously uh, very important, especially if it's a career change. Um, the high manager, letting the hire understand that you know what it is you're pursuing is a lot more comforting than someone just saying, hey, I applied because it sounded interesting, but they really have no idea what it is that they're, you know, potentially doing in that role. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that narrative is important. Okay. Um... So Kelly, earlier you mentioned a marketing resume. Someone was asking if you could describe what that is. Yeah, you know, I'll, um, if there's any way I need to kind of clean up that document, I was going to include it and um, I'm happy to send it to somebody too and give you the blanket document. But again, it's kind of just the general uh, overview of, you know, what would be important to them. And this is something I've communicated to people too. If it's again, and I know target salary that can ebb and flow depending upon the organization geography, but you know, if it's anywhere from target compensation to industries and verticals, it can sometimes include what you don't want to do, which is very helpful um, to me to understand what you're looking to stay away from company size, hierarchy, uh, management experience. So kind of all of that bundled together and Again, if I can get that document cleaned up and kind of provide structure, I'm happy to send it to the powers that be to take a look at. Yeah, okay. So it's basically like, I think most people see a resume of just like, this is my name and this is all the jobs that I've had. This is what I did at that job. But maybe like taking more control of that narrative and saying, I had this job. These are the things that I want you to know about it. Or these are the skills that I want you to know about. In my summary, this is specifically what I'm looking for, just being more like targeted and in control of the story that they're going to see about you rather than just these are the jobs and this is what I did. So I like right. that. That makes sense. Cool. Um, okay. We have time for a few more questions. Um, let me see. Um, how important are referrals in assuring that a resume will pass the recruiter screen? Okay. Okay. Um, Kyla, I'll start with you. What would you say, I guess, if they're going to list the referrals on their resume, that's where you're going to see it. How, um, how much of a difference does that make? I, uh, getting to the recruiter, getting to that first interview, I think the referrals don't really mean that much. Um, it's really, I mean, definitely gives you a little bit of confidence that someone's willing to provide referrals up front. Um, it's just, a, a, yeah, I would say I just am a little more confident in that candidate, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, those are really only necessary towards the end of the process at the offer stage. Hmm, okay. Or an offer possibly. Um, so here's a, here's an interesting question. I keep getting to the, the finals. I guess they know that they've gotten through maybe three to five rounds of interviews. So they know they're getting far along in the process, but they're not getting a final offer. They're senior level professional. Um, Kelly, what do you think is happening there where they keep getting several interviews for different jobs, but not getting the actual offer. Any advice on what could be going on or what they could do? Yeah, it's hard because there could be a lot of things going on yeah. in that final stages. I mean, I think a lot of that job search process is kind of determining like where you're not moving forward. So if you're sending resumes out, nobody's calling you, you got to you gotta change up the resume. But if you're getting to that point where you're interviewing and certainly always honing your interviewing skills and you know communicating that value and you know, basically making sure that you are having those conversations to make sure you're moving on to next step to offer. But there's sometimes elements that are beyond your control, which is hard for me to say, well, you might not be yeah. doing this or that. I mean, there could just be a stronger candidate in the mix. And, you know, depending upon their experience or their vert or whatever it might be, it's just hard. It's, it's the things that you can't control. So it's mm -hmm. All I can say is maybe, I mean, it's great if you can get feedback from those hiring managers. Again, typically legally, you might not get a lot of context. If you do, that's great. Um, otherwise, just kind of keep practicing your interviewing skills. And yeah, it, I mean, it's hard to, to understand if you're not getting any specific feedback at those stages. Yeah. Um, okay. So Kyle, a follow-up to that. I know you and I have talked about um, questions that you could ask in an interview. And, and some of those questions are, getting more details on exactly what they're looking for. Do you think that would help with this, this problem that this person is having is 
getting those details on like specifically they want in a candidate, maybe it'll help to answer that question of why am I not getting an offer? Uh, yes. So, um, those questions, I mean, those questions that can definitely help. I think if you're, if you're asking the hiring team and you're trying to elicit what it is they're trying to accomplish with the role, mm -hmm. um, you can, you can just further relate your experience to what it is they're, you know, trying to accomplish, whether that's the fix all for what this person's dealing with. I, you know, it's hard to say, but yeah, true. Um, yeah it's just something else that can strengthen use candidate. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I, that makes sense. There's just a lot of, lot of variables there. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find a couple more that we can get to. Um, so if the recruiters, we talked about how it can help to contact a recruiter, but if the contact info is not listed with the job description, how could they find them? I, I would add to this, is there like, is there a level where you're going too far to find them to where like, if you were to get a personal email from someone, you'd be like, how did you even find me? Or does that not matter? You're just kind of impressed they found you. Um, but but how could they find you if if like your contact info isn't there? Um, Kelly, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, and I think if we're talking about recruiters, probably most recruiters don't mind that inbound messaging, hiring managers maybe, but um, I would imagine that all recruiters do not mind being found. Um, they respect that very much as it's something that they do. So. Um, I would say, you know, if they don't have that information, I mean, again, LinkedIn is a tool that you can use. There's also some email scrapers. I love Hunter IO, um, which usually will show the formatting of the company's email where you can find somebody and reach out to them too. Um, but <clears throat> that's kind of my recommendation is kind of just doing a quick internet search and you should be able to find. Uh, yeah. Them. I know also on LinkedIn, you can go to a company and then go to the people tab and it'll show you all the people that work oh, there right. that are on LinkedIn. And then you can even search by job title. So you could mm -hmm. search for a recruiter and find, there might be more than one, um, but there might be a couple or maybe you're comfortable reaching out to all of them. So that's a good option. Um, here's a simple question. I'm kind of curious about this. Kyle, do you know, is Glassdoor a good resource for salary ranges? Um, it, it definitely can be. I would say um, it's not 100% accurate, but it's a good place to start in many cases. Okay. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I just, I just trust it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'll do one more and then we'll, we'll end. So um, I've seen this question a few times. Do you have preferred job boards or someone wanted to ask, like, there's so many out there. Is there is there one that's better or that you check more often? Um, Kelly, do you do you know, like, is there a preferred job board, one that would be better to apply on than the others? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, Google's a great resource. I mean, if you can like figure out Google Boolean search strings, use that. And, you know, I'm sure if you Google how to, do, how to use those search strings that you can start pulling from all these different websites. Company websites are great. I mean, if you're targeting your career search, you can set up alerts for particular companies. I imagine with LinkedIn, there's some that are paid. So not all companies are going to pay to advertise their jobs on LinkedIn. Actually a quick hack too, is if you, again, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, but if you're using LinkedIn, you can do a search string and just like the regular keywords to search posts. So if hiring managers, recruiters that aren't paying to advertise their jobs but are posting in the content, you can go up to keywords and write, you know, hiring, you know, software engineer, whatever it might be. And you might be able to pull up information in posts of okay. the people who are actually hiring and then job opportunities too. So um, yeah, I guess those are my two. Okay. Things. Yeah. So it sounds like there's maybe not really like a preference or one. Kyle, would you say the same thing that it really doesn't matter so much aside from maybe applying directly on the company side, but Aside from that, it's kind of all the same. Yeah, I would say most of them are really built the same. I think LinkedIn is still a little bit ahead of everyone, but not by very much. Okay. And then follow up to that, when someone does apply on, say, LinkedIn or Indeed, does it come to you the same as if they had applied on the, uh, the company site? Does it still just go into the ATS the same way, or does it require an extra step for you to see those applicants? Um, Kyle, I'll start with you. Um, it depends if you have it integrated with your ATS. Um, okay. so it's, most ATS will integrate directly with LinkedIn so that their applicants will go into the ATS, but 
some people don't have that set up yet, so they'll have to go into LinkedIn itself to view their applicants. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't. I, yeah, I Kelly, I'll let you go. Sorry to cut you off. I was gonna say I don't have that uh, integrated into my CRM system, so I can look in, native in LinkedIn to see that application and, and see how many people apply. But I'll also get an email notification as well. Okay, so then I guess that's why it might be better to apply through the company site because if they don't have that integration, then that's like an extra step. And okay. Um, well, both of you, I really appreciate you joining this. We had so many questions. Um, Kyle, thanks for jumping in last minute, but really a lot of great insights. So thank you very much for your time. Um, again, everyone, thank you for attending. Remember, you can get 20% off JobScan Premium. The code is, or the URL is up here, jobscan.co slash promo slash no fear 2022. We have three more sessions this week and they're going to be really, really great sessions. It's almost like the best for last. So we'll see y'all in uh, in future sessions. Kelly and Kyle, thank you again for joining and uh, we'll see y'all later. Bye.